Hello, and welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for listening to another episode this week. I put out episodes every Tuesday and Friday, and for everybody new, I am a registered holistic nutritionist and female biohacker, I guess, or biohacker specializing in women's health, however you want to word it. I guess I'm both. (laughs) And this is a place where I talk about health and wellness and all of that good stuff. Shout out to all of the DMs that I got last week being so kind and just giving me such good feedback on the podcast. It really means a lot to me. And I sound so cheesy, but it actually makes a difference if someone sends me a message or comments on a video and it's like, I love your podcast. Like, thank you so much for everything that you do. That means the world because I work online. So I don't really work with anybody in person and just, you know, hearing from my little community makes me feel like I'm a part of a community and it just feels like way more less isolating and more of us like all in this wellness thing together on this wellness health journey together. And so I just appreciate the two minutes it takes to do that. If you've done that in the past. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And today we are getting into the second part of the deep nutrition dive that I'm doing. We're basically looking at all the different foods and which ones to favor and which ones to avoid. I skipped over a lot of the anatomy digestion aspects of this because it would just get way too long in the tooth to do a single episode on that. So this is more just like the different categories and which ones I think are the best and which ones the research actually shows are the best, which is more important than my opinion. If you haven't listened to part one, please go do so. It was released. It's probably the episode right before this one. Yeah, it was. So, you know, you can listen to them back to back and take notes and do all those good things if you feel like you need to. I know when I listen to episodes like this, I always learn something new. So I always either write it down or actually send a text message to myself. If there's like a fact or something, I'm like, okay, I actually want to action item that, you know? And so that's kind of my own method of doing it. And then I also download and save the episodes and like sometimes re-listen to them later on. Before we dive in, a shout out to Bioptimizers. Thank you. You guys are the best. They have the best digestive enzymes out there. I just talked about these the other day and they are basically little coenzymes that help digest your food. So, you know, while we're talking about nutrition and all these different good and bad foods, essentially, these enzymes help break down those foods, whether they're good or bad. But if you are eating something that is, you know, more bad, let's say, or unhealthy, then you really want to be taking digestive enzymes to really mitigate the negative effects that can come from that food. So if you're having like pizza or ice cream or just something super calorie rich or processed, it can really help break it down and cause less inflammation and digestive upset that can come from food like that. Great for people who are sensitive to lactose, gluten, you know, eggs, nuts, anything like that, because it just really helps break down those different proteins and helps us absorb the food and the nutrients better. So I take them all the time. Literally, I take them daily. And so I would not recommend them if I did not take them. And a shout out to Leela Quantum Tech. We did a podcast episode probably about a month ago, and it's one of my most downloaded episodes. And we really talked about quantum energy and what it means to be living in today's world with EMF and radiation and 5G and how does that actually impact our health. And so Leela Quantum Tech has, you know, over 60 studies now that have looked at how their different products mitigate the negative side effects of these different energies that come from different devices, like a computer or phone, Wi-Fi, things like that. So they essentially neutralize the EMF in your home. I have the infinity block. It's beautiful. It's like this gold block and it sits beside my bed and it it does that exactly. Like it neutralizes all of the EMF in my apartment. And then I also have their heel capsule, which I love and wear when I travel. So I have it on the necklace and I wear it on the plane, stuff like that, just to kind of give me a peace of mind when I worry about 
radiation and things like that happening around me because I just think a lot of it we don't fully understand and a lot of it is so new and rapidly changing. So it's great to have a company that's continually studying this and putting out research and looking at how this is impacting our health. So I will link both of those in the show notes for you to take a look at. And you can use my discount codes as well, obviously to save, which is really helpful when buying any of this biohacking health and wellness stuff. So definitely, definitely check that out. All right, so let's dive in. We left off on root vegetables, and now we're actually going to dive right into vegetables, fruits, and berries. So these are the veggies that are aside from the root ones that I covered in part one. So it is generally recommended to eat five to nine portions, which is around 400 grams of fruit, vegetables, and berries daily. Only about 10% of people meet these recommendations. I don't even know if I meet those recommendations. I, honestly, I probably, I probably do most days. A study conducted in Finland showed that 75% of Finnish males are ate only two servings of fruits, vegetables, and berries per day. Wow, that is wild. So there has been a ton of research on this. You know, we've always heard since growing up, eat your fruits and vegetables. This is not the first time that, you know, this is nothing new that I'm saying right now. Now, there is significant variability in the absorption of many vegetables, fruits, and berries, depending on the preparation method. The same compound may also be absorbed differently from different ingredients. For example, the beta carotene contained by papaya are more radically absorbed compared to those in carrots. Now, I think what's interesting here is like the research, if you if you go by this, says like five to nine portions of fruits, vegetables, and berries daily. Like what what is the breakup of that? Is it all fruit and then that's okay and you get all of those portions in? Probably not, right? Because as much as we love fruit, as much as it can be antioxidant rich, rich and just be filled with bioflavonoids and the different molecules and nutrients that are really great for us, especially from a aging and longevity standpoint, we still have to think about the sugar component in it, which is fructose. Now, obviously, eating an apple is going to be better than eating a candy bar, like hands down. Because it's a whole food, there's a ton of other nutrients in there, minerals, vitamins, coenzymes, everything like that. But it still can spike your blood sugar and we have to be aware of that content. So what you could do is you could do like one part fruit, two parts berry, and three parts vegetables in a day, which would get you to five. So majority of your portions are coming from vegetables. I love berries. I always have the berry, berries in the fridge now. I do strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries. I do all of them. And then I also eat quite a lot of apples and pears and oranges. I actually eat a lot of fruit right now. <laughs> it is recommended to acquire nutrients from vegetables and berries by consuming them with fat to improve absorption. Fruits and root vegetables may be used to supplement the diet, particularly after exercise or in the evening to encourage sleep. So a great example of this, like with the with the berries and fat, like you could do yogurt with berries or even fruit with fat. You could do like apple with almond butter. That's like, those are the very common ones that you see people pair together. Some fruits can be used strategically for specific health benefits. And, you know, we're not going to get too much into the weeds for this, but there are different fruits that are great for different things. And you can honestly find a lot of that online. We definitely do need to consider our quality of fruit, especially because 90% of pesticide residues come from intensely farmed imported fruit. When buying fruit, it is worthwhile to invest in organic produce to minimize the amount of harmful toxins. So my way that I navigate this, and this is like a tip and a hack, sure, that I would give you is... It is obviously not the cheapest thing to buy everything organic. And a lot of people don't have access to that. So as great as that, I would love to say, just buy 100% organic. Like it's just simply not realistic for most people, unfortunately. So 
there's a couple ways you can mitigate this. You can go by the Clean 15, which is a list that the EWG puts out every single year that lists the top 15 clean fruits and vegetables that have the least amount of pesticides in them, which you can buy not organic. Or you could also look at the EWG's Dirty Dozen, which is the flip side of that, where they take the 12 dirtiest or worst vegetables and fruits and say, hey, really try to buy these ones organic. I will link those in the show notes so that you can take a look at them. My other way that I go about this is I actually judge it on the type of fruit and the type of vegetable, specifically if there is a peel or not. So for example, berries, I always buy organic because you are literally buying and eating that berry that came right off of the tree or the bush or whatever it is. There is very little barrier between any pesticide sprayed and what you're actually consuming. And this is applied as well to leafy greens, especially. So I'm very conscious about anytime I'm building a salad, buying stuff for a salad, like it, or however I'm using leafy greens, that it is organic. Now, things that I don't necessarily always buy organic are things like avocado. There is a peel on there and that is a barrier. It's not foolproof, but it actually does help. You could also think about things like a banana or a pumpkin if you're just eating the inside of it, stuff like that. So like just kind of think outside the box of how you typically might judge on what to buy organic and not organic. So for this, for fruit specifically, you want to favor locally grown seasonal fruit. Seasonal makes a difference. So I talked about this a while ago. You know, it's weird now because I don't know if it's weird, but in North America and probably most parts, not most, probably a lot of parts of the world, you can get any type of fruit all year, but doesn't necessarily mean that you should be eating that fruit. And you can tell the difference. Like you can tell the difference so much on what is in season and what is not in season. So for example, Right now, I'm buying strawberries and I'm buying organic strawberries and the flavor is like subpar, okay? Let's just be real. It's not that great. It's February. It's not that great. And I still eat them and I'm just like, oh, like, okay, sure. Compared to buying strawberries grown in Canada or maybe even the US in strawberry season, which I think is like spring, like early summer. And then the flavor is so rich and I'm like, wow, these taste phenomenal. Same with apples, same with oranges. Oranges are in season or, you know, in the winter. And then when I buy oranges in the summer, I'm like, wow, okay, this is not the time for oranges. Same thing. So there are, there are definitely benefits to eating with the seasons and getting more nutrients in the fruit that you choose if you eat it in the season that it is actually grown. Now, a lot of things, a lot of what happens, especially in Canada is, you know, we're importing oranges from Florida. So when they pick oranges off the trees in Florida, it's not like it's picked, you know, fully ripe, juicy, ready to be eaten. It's picked, you know, a couple of weeks beforehand, and then it ripens in the truck, in the crate, however it gets to Canada. And so it really actually doesn't get as much benefit and nutrients because it doesn't stay on the tree all the way until it ripens and then you eat it. So the ways around that, it's tough. It's tough if you live in a place like Canada. The ways around that would be eat locally, so which automatic, automatically makes you eat seasonally. So only fruit that is grown in you know whatever radius that you think is appropriate could be like 100 kilometers, something like that. So that would be really great for ensuring that the fruit and vegetables are properly ripened before eating them. Or, I don't know, I don't know what that or is here, but, or you can just be like me and just buy it anyway and just stick to it. And I didn't notice as big of a difference for this until I was in Costa Rica last March. I've been there a few times. And in March, I went for three weeks and I was astonished when we went to this market. We went to this beautiful vegetable farmer's market and the food, the vegetables and fruit were so, so good. And everything comes from the country, okay? Nothing, I shouldn't say everything, majority 
right? So it's not imported. It's literally like you're eating this mango that was grown in Costa Rica. And you're like, why does this taste so good? The sizes are different. The colors are different. The shapes are more organic. They they look less all the same. They look more natural. And it was just phenomenal produce, like absolutely phenomenal produce. And I just was obsessed. And then you go back to Canada and you go into the grocery store and you're like, okay, everything looks the same. And all of the fruit and vegetables that don't look like this are thrown out. And they're all imported from like the States, Mexico, further South, because we can't really grow a lot of that here. And then you're just thinking, okay, how many nutrients am I really getting from this food? Anyway, that is my tangent about food. You know, the, I guess the alternative is like live somewhere tropical <laughs> and enjoy <laughs> fresh produce year round, which is my goal, you know, within five years is to live somewhere tropical. So we'll see if that happens. And that is, yeah, that sounds like a more fun goal than trying to just eat in the season in the less tropical place that you might be living. Okay. Organic fruit, fatty fruits, such as avocado. Avocado is a fruit. I know, surprising. Olives are fruit as well. Low sugar fruits. So things like lemon, lime, grapefruit, kiwi. I love kiwi. I love grapefruit. And nutritious nutritious fruits that contain slightly more sugar. So papaya, nectarines, peaches, watermelon, pomegranates, apples. I love all of those. And then what you can also do, what you should kind of use sparingly is varieties cultivated for extreme sweetness, right? So we all kind of know these and you know them because they are always added to smoothies when you order a smoothie from somewhere. So things like banana, fig, mango, dried fruits, such as dates, raisins, and apricots, apricots. And then optimal time of consumption is after exercise or in the evening because it can help us sleep. And then varieties cultivated for sweetness, mandarin, orange, pear, plum, pineapple. So yeah, I would just be careful with this, the fruits that, like I just mentioned, that are super, super sweet because you can just tell, (laughs) you can get the sugar rush from it. And so just use them sparingly, try to eat them in season, and then obviously avoid commercial fruit juices and concentrated juice, artificially added fructose. When it comes to juice, I just can't with it. Like, why? If you're an adult, why are you drinking juice? No, (laughs) like, absolutely not. What are you doing? I think there's a time and place. I think if you make cold pressed juice at home, sure. If you buy organic cold pressed juice and it's got, you know, a bunch of different vegetables in it and fruit in it, sure. Okay. But if you are drinking a glass of orange juice for, for breakfast in the morning still, I, I'm concerned for you. And I, I just don't, I just don't understand. For kids for this, what I see a lot of parents doing is giving their kids things like coconut water, which I think is a great alternative, or taking, I guess, like organic cold pressed apple juice and diluting it a lot. So it'll be like a fourth apple juice. And then the rest of it is water that's added to it. I think that's a really smart idea. I would just be very careful about getting them hooked on very concentrated juices because there's really, really no benefit from them. There's no fiber. There's no nutrients, really. Like it's just a pure, pure sugar rush. Okay, so if we want to also move past fruit, we do want to talk about berries. I think berries are kind of in their own realm. Obviously, berries are fruit, but berries are kind of, they hit different. Berries have a ton of health benefits. That's probably why. So regardless of the diet that you follow, like vegan, paleo, keto, whatever it is, nearly all dietary guidelines recommend the daily consumption of berries, usually around 150 to 200 grams, which is five to seven ounces. In general, berries are rich in vitamins, flavonoids, polyphenols, and insoluble fiber. They contain less sugar compared to fruit. Polyphenols give berries their distinctive color and act as part of various defense mechanisms. Whenever possible, it is very beneficial to eat nutrient-rich wild berries as they have much higher levels of polyphenols compared to cultivated berries. Again, we have to be careful of the pesticide use, which I already mentioned. So we just want to be choosing organic when it comes to berries. I 
I really don't think there's much way around this when it comes to berries. I, even if it's local, like I would probably still choose organic local or organic, not local. The regular consumption of berries protects the cardiovascular system from oxidative stress, lowers blood pressure, and reduces the level of inflammatory agents in the blood. Berry consumption also lowers the risk of type 2 diabetes. Additionally, berries have properties that promote the health of the brain and the eyes. So lots and lots of benefits here. I do want to mention frozen berries as well. So be careful when you're buying these imported frozen berries. There have been many cases of outbreaks in which frozen berries have been contaminated with the neurovirus, the hepatitis A virus, which are definitely things that we want to consider. So you can boil your frozen berries for at least two minutes or cook them for five minutes to avoid any food poisoning. And exotic berries such as goji, inca, and mulberry have been trendy in the past decade as well. The nutritional values of these berries are indeed good. However, they may contain pesticide residues and sulfur dioxide used as a preservative. I typically don't eat those. Sometimes I have goji berries, but I I usually don't eat those. Do you know if you're getting enough magnesium? Because four out of five Americans aren't. And that's a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 300 biochemical reactions in your body. Today, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look for that could indicate you're magnesium deficient. Listen carefully to the end because there's a special offer happening and this could be exactly what you need. Okay, here we go. Are you irritable or anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you sometimes constipated? There are dozens of symptoms of magnesium deficiency. So these are just a few of the most common ones. Now, here's what most people don't know. Taking just any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem because most supplements use the cheapest kinds that your body can't use or absorb. That's why I exclusively recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the only full-spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and absorb. All Bioptimizer supplements are best in class, which is why I use them. If for some reason you feel differently, you can get a full refund, no questions asked. They are so confident that they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee. Just go to bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany. In addition to the discount you get by using my promo code biohackingbrittany, you get gifts with your purchase. That's right. You actually get gifts up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough. So act fast. This is a limited time offer. You can go to bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany. Use my code. It's linked in my show notes on my website and start taking your magnesium today. Okay, so what do we want to favor? We want to favor wild berries. So bilberries, lingon, lingon berries, cranberries, black currant, blackberries, sea buckthorn, cloud berries. I love cloud berries, actually. Arctic raspberries, crow berries, wild raspberries, and wild strawberries. Locally grown cultivated berries, berry powders, imported organic berries. And we want to avoid imported frozen berries or non-organic ones. All right, vegetables. So this is obviously applicable to everything that's not a root vegetable. Vegetables mainly refer to cultivated plants of which the juicy parts growing above ground are used for food. The top five vegetables in the U.S., based on how much households spend on them, have remained almost the same for the past 20 years. So tomatoes, potatoes, mushrooms, lettuce, and carrots. The most popular vegetable is tomato, which is not a bad choice necessarily. Lycopene in tomatoes has been found to protect from cancer, stroke, and cardiovascular disease. So there are so many studies on vegetable consumption. Eating plenty of green vegetables in particular is beneficial. Vegetables are rich in phytonutrients such as flavonoids and polyphenols, as well as trace elements and vitamins. The darker the color, the more likely the vegetable is to contain plenty of these protective nutrients that reduce silent inflammation and prevent various kinds of cancer. So there's different categories of 
vegetables. So wild greens, which is kind of like what I touched on. So harvesting wild greens is called foraging. Wild plants are not just worthless weeds. (laughs) The interest in foraging has seen a rapid rise in popularity in the recent years. The most well-known and easy to use wild greens include nettle, dandelion, fireweed, yarrow, and ground elder. I haven't had a lot of those. I've had dandelion and nettle, but I, I definitely don't forge my own wild greens right now, although I would be interested in learning more about that. So what do you want to favor? You want to favor wild greens, the darkest green vegetables such as kale and chard. I know so many people are on the fence about kale. Sprouts and new crops, cabbages and onions, if you can tolerate onions. And then you want to avoid iceberg lettuce and other similar varieties because they have very few nutrients. Pale, wilted, translucent vegetables, mass-produced vegetables, and uncooked nightshades that are rich in anti-nutrients, and particularly eggplant if you are sensitive to nicotine. So that is really interesting. I, you know, I should do a whole episode on anti-nutrients and nightshades because we are touching on it a lot. So maybe I will do that. Okay, let's move into fats and oils. This is definitely one of the biggest topics and things that we need to discuss because there are so many different types of fat and we just need to kind of break it down and figure out what you should avoid and actually what you should favor. So all butter sold in the US must be composed of at least 80% milk fat. In Europe, it's a little different that they can have, they cannot have any additional ingredients such as vegetable oils added to it, which is kind of scary for the U.S. actually. Butter made from a fermented cream is known as cultured butter, whereas butter made from pasteurized fresh cream is called sweet cream butter. That makes sense. So according to folklore, saturated fats, example like hard fats, cause cardiovascular disease, And a comprehensive meta-analysis from 2014 does not support this hypothesis. So this is basically touching on the crazy fat fear time that the world kind of went through in the 90s, potentially the 80s, I'm not sure, where everything was fat-free and fat was bad for you and fat made you fat and it was causing cardiovascular problems and all of these things. A lot of that has been disproven now. We, the current nutritional landscape does not support that and really promotes consuming healthy fat as part of your dietary, you know, as part of your plate, as a part of your diet, because it is really, really needed for different components, especially hormonal health, especially reproductive health. So it is something that we've kind of moved away from, thankfully, but I think it is still kind of has this little hands in different areas in society still. The health benefits of fats and oils are often seen only from the viewpoint of fatty acids and fat metabolism. However, many oils also contain other health beneficial compounds such as polyphenols and adding fats or for example, avocado into food may also improve the absorption of fat soluble compounds. So there are fat soluble vitamins, which are vitamin A, D, E, and K. And when you have something that has a high amount of that in it. Typically, it actually is in a fat, but the fat actually just helps with the absorption of that. So a big one we can talk about is coconut oil. So cold-pressed virgin coconut oil should not be confused with coconut shortening, often used for deep frying. Virgin coconut oil does not contain traces of the solvent used when processing shortening, nor has the oil been refined, bleached, or hydrogenated. So coconut oil, super, super healthy and can be used for a lot of different things. You can, you can cook with it. You just have to be careful of the temperature and how high it goes. I have baked with it before. I give it to my dog every single day. And I think that's kind of where I use it. It's not my, it's definitely not my go-to cooking oil or yeah, or even raw oil as of right now. Then we have butter and ghee. So butter contains many nutrients such as CLA and vitamins A, D, and K, which I, like I just said, those are the fat soluble vitamins. High quality butter also contains trace amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. 
The quality and healthiness of the butter depends on the proportion of grass in the producing cow's diet, the cow's general health, and the time it's spent outdoors, as well as the level of nutrients in the soil. So if you're buying butter and you can tolerate it, I really, really suggest you get grass-fed butter if you can, because it's just going to be so much more nutrient dense for you. Saturated fat and in particular, the fatty acids present in butter are needed for the normal function of cell membranes and the heart to carry calcium into the bones and for hormone production. The saturated fat in butter also significantly increases the feeling of satiety. Okay, the next we can obviously talk about is ghee. So ghee is actually really, really great for baking. The traditional Indian method of making clarified butter, which is what ghee is, removes the milk proteins from the butter, making the resulting product lactose-free. Because ghee contains no milk protein, it can withstand high temperatures. This makes it a very good cooking oil. And ghee does not contain any harmful trans fats, that can cause heart disease and any other health problems. I love baking with ghee. It's like one of the best ones that I use. Then we can talk about olive oil. I love olive oil. So good olive oil is made by picking and selecting the olives by hand. The olives are pressed within 18 hours of picking. And the pressing occurs at a temperature below 27 degrees Celsius, which is 80 degrees Fahrenheit which retains all of the natural antioxidants of the olive oil. So I really, really love oil, olive oil. I use it raw. I never really cook with it. So I use it with like salads or on dishes afterwards for flavoring. So, so good. And I actually went to a olive tasting, olive oil tasting, I guess, when I was in California. And it was really awesome because they got to understand how they make the olive oil and the process of it. And I bought a ton of olive oil from that place. So I, you know, a lot of the time when there's vineyards, there's also olive, I don't know if, I don't think they're called vineyards, like olive farms maybe. And they do olive oil tastings and it's so good. It's so worth going because that olive oil is like the best. It's so, so rich. The regular use of virgin olive oil is associated with a lower risk of stroke and various types of cancer. Virgin olive oil has been shown to lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. And in addition, brain health and performance may be improved with the regular use of virgin olive oil. And then we can talk about fish oil. So fish oil and fish liver oil are recommended for individuals who do not eat enough fish, which is a lot of us. So general guidelines recommend eating fatty fish twice per week. Fish and other seafood contain, you know, great omega-3 and omega-3s can be found in many vegetable oils, but they mostly contain short chain alpha linoleic acid, ALA, which is poorly absorbed, particularly in men, which is very interesting. So fish oil can kind of help with that. I do currently take a fish oil. So the intake of omega-3 fatty acids improves mood, increases attentiveness, and generally improves cognitive function. According to a study report, omega-3 fatty acids are highly beneficial, especially in the treatment of depression. That's very interesting, actually. The intake of omega-3 fatty acids reduces the silent inflammatory condition of the system, which is often a contributing factor to many chronic illnesses. Okay, lastly, we obviously have to talk about vegetable oils, which are the worst of the worst. So, High quality vegetable oil blends may help in achieving a good balance of fatty acids in the system. However, some vegetable oils are not beneficial due to their high level of omega-6 fatty acid. Processed vegetable oils are also highly oxidizing and may increase inflammation in the system for that reason alone. So you really, I'm not a fan of vegetable oil. I'm really not. I, yeah, even in a small amount. I I just don't think it's worth it. The balance ratio of omega-6 and omega-3 in indigenous people was approximately two to one, which is considered ideal. So two omega-6 to one omega-3. The imbalance of fatty acids may cause silent inflammation in the system. However, in Europe, the ratio is on average eight to one and the US up to 20 to one. 
Now, why is that? That is because fried food is made with vegetable oil. So, and not even just fried food, like packaged food, processed food in general is made with that vegetable oil. So it's kind of in everything. It's really hard to avoid. And so for that reason, I will never ever buy it or use it because I'm already naturally going to get it through however, whatever food I might go out and eat one day out of the week or something like that. So we want to favor organic fats and oils rich in omega-3 fatty acids, ghee and butter, fish liver oil and krill oil, cold pressed virgin oil and coconut oils, cold pressed avocado, macadamia and hemp oils, oils stored in dark glass bottles protected from light and heat, always with that, high quality cold pressed vegetable oil blends, Uh, if you want, if you can even find high quality, I don't even know what that would look like. And then we want to avoid hydrogenated vegetable fats, vegetable oils rich in omega-6 fatty acids, oils stored in plastic bottles, oxidized oils, oils exposed to light and heat. Again, with your oils, keep them away from your stove, your microwave, anything that heats up in your kitchen. They should be put in a cabinet, in a dark cabinet away from the light as well stored in a cool place as well. Next, we have to talk about nuts. Nuts are extremely nutrient-dense and rich in protein, good fatty acids, minerals, fibers, and vitamin E and B complex. The flavor, consistency, and convenience of nuts has been has made many people increase the amount of various nuts in their diet. So I eat a lot of nuts. They are definitely a big part of my diet. The regular consumption of of nuts is associated with a significantly lower risk of cardio, cardio, coronary artery disease, and lower mortality in individuals at risk of cardiovascular disease. So there are so many, so many benefits with this. And there's so many different types of nuts. We can touch on them briefly, but I think a lot of us kind of know which ones are healthy and which ones aren't. So if we start with pistachios, so compared to other nuts, Pistachios are rich in beta carotene and lutein, and the consumption of pistachios has been found to have a positive effect on the intestinal microbiome. Man, I love pistachios. So, so, so good. Brazil nuts contain the most selenium out of all foods. Eating two Brazil nuts per day may raise the selenium levels in the body as much as 100 mcgs per taking a selenium tablet, which is very interesting. Then we have walnuts. So walnuts are exceptionally rich in short chain omega-3 fatty acids and may improve blood cholesterol levels. Almonds make an excellent snack that reduces hunger and maintains a constant blood sugar level. In addition, almonds may improve insulin sensitivity and blood sugar regulation when eaten with carbohydrates. They may also lower the risk of coronary artery disease. Pecan nuts or pecans improve the antioxidant uh, capacity of the body and inhibit the oxidation of LDL cholesterol. And then macadamia nuts, which are so good, have the highest fat content of all nuts. They contain nearly 80% fat, the majority of which consists of monounsaturated fatty acids. Macadamia nuts have been found to have properties that lower oxidative stress, inflammation, and cholesterol, particularly in individuals with marked increased cholesterol levels. I love macadamia nuts. I've actually made my own macadamia nut butter at home, which was so good, so fatty, so rich, and just so worth it. But honestly, macadamia nuts are so expensive. And the macadamia nut butter, if you can find it, is so expensive. So I do not buy that. So what do we want to favor? It's kind of everything I just said. Walnuts, Brazil nuts, macadamia nuts, almonds, pistachio, pecans, and cashews. And we want to avoid peanuts. In spite of their name, they are actually a legume and they are rich in anti-nutrients and highly allergenic. Hazelnuts, you know, they have a, they readily cause allergies. I do not like hazelnuts. That's so funny. Roasted, rancid, salted, and coated nuts. So if you're going to buy nuts, try to buy organic and then look for raw, unsalted, unroasted. So you're kind of just getting the healthiest ones you can. Obviously, people soak them, they activate them, they do all these things to reduce the anti-nutrients in them. 
you know, we're not going to talk about that today, but there are different ways that you can prepare them to kind of make them a bit more healthier on your body. Okay. Then we have seeds. Seeds. There's so many types of seeds. So seeds are extremely nutrient dense. However, they are plant parts rich in compounds with which the plants attempt to protect the seeds from damage. Due to this, pre-processing seeds by soaking and sprouting is fairly important for the absorption of nutrients and the removal of harmful substances, which is what I was just saying. So there's so many different ways you can prepare seeds and you can soak and sprout them in different ways. Definitely look that up online because there's different, there's kind of different rules for different ones, essentially. We're not going to go through all of them because it's just too long, but there are some that you want to soak for longer, some you want to soak for overnight, and some you don't want to soak at all. So you want to favor hemp seeds, chia seeds, lin seeds, which are also known as flax seeds, and pumpkin seeds. And then additionally, many seeds have therapeutic values. So like pine nuts, grapefruit seeds. I've never seen grapefruit seeds, actually. Milk thistle seeds, also haven't seen. Pomegranate seeds, I have seen, which are very great for reducing oxidative stress and cumin seeds. And you want to use sparingly sunflower seeds and sesame seeds. If you're like me, you are thinking about your energy field, you're thinking about radiation, EMF, and 5G around you. And honestly, you're kind of worried about it as well. What if I told you you could just get a product, put it in your house, set it and forget it, and know that you're actually reducing the amount of EMF and radiation around you? That's where Lila Quantum Tech comes in. Their products actually neutralize EMF, even in electric cars. And this is so, so important because we are so bombarded with the amount of EMF and radiation in today's society. So their key product that I love is their Infinity Block. And it has actually been proven to increase ATP production, which is the energy in our cells, by 20 to 29%. So this really, really does matter. Leela Quantum Tech has over 59 studies and they actually also have another six in progress. They are randomized, placebo-controlled and double-blind studies proving the great benefits of their products. I really suggest you get this infinity block. If you can get something that you can put in your house and say, hey, this is actually helping to neutralize how much EMF me and my family are exposed to, it just makes sense. Why would you not want some sort of safety measure like that that you can count on? They also have a heel capsule, which is like a little capsule that you can bring with you anywhere you go. And it does this same thing, obviously, to a smaller degree and smaller circumference around you. So I like to wear this when I go on planes because there's so much radiation on planes and EMF. And I like to wear it just in general when I travel. Their products have been proven to optimize HRV and improve your blood and obviously ATP production, like I said. So that's what I would do. I would really recommend looking into how you can manage your quantum energy field better because this is such a key aspect of optimizing your health. You can get a significant discount through the link on my website and also in the show notes. And that will help you be able to get this at a better price. So again, that's Leela Quantum Tech. I have the Infinity Block. It's in my bedroom. I actually sleep right beside it. And then I also have their heel capsule on a necklace that I take with me everywhere I go. And these are the two that I would recommend. I think this is a great starting pack for you and provides substantial coverage in order to neutralize the EMF that's around you and optimize your health. Now we can talk about legumes. So I personally don't eat a lot of legumes, but they're definitely worth mentioning because a lot of people do. The fruit produced by legumes are called pods. The term legumes generally includes various pea plants and cultivated legumes. The most commonly used legumes include soybeans, peanuts, lentils, chickpeas, beans, and peas. So out of those, I guess I eat chickpeas and peanuts, I guess, if I have peanut butter. More than 40% of legumes are dried for human consumption. The vast majority of the world's bean production takes place in India. Despite the anti-nutrients that kind of come with 
legumes that we know about. Legumes also have some health benefits. So there have been studies that have kind of looked at this and looked at the different antioxidants that they might contain that can help. I do want to do a little shout out to soy and I guess shout out is the wrong word. I do want to mention soy because I think we also went through a soy craze at one point, just like we went through a fat-free craze. So soy is not my favorite. I have never been a you know, person who's advocated for soy because there are many reasons why soy is just not that great for us. So soy is rich in phytates that inhibit the, the absorption of nutrients in the intestine. Tripipsin inhibitors in soy may impair the absorption of proteins. They have phytoestrogens in it, which is my biggest reason for avoiding them. And soy may interfere with normal female hormonal activity, impair thyroid function, cause infertility in men, and promote the development of breast cancer in women. That is like the number one reason I don't mess around with soy. Like I don't even have soy sauce. So if I have sushi or something that would typically have soy sauce, I will use coconut aminos instead. And that has become way more readily available now and tastes great. I also don't eat tofu. I don't, yeah, I don't drink soy milk or have soy yogurt or anything like that. As much as 94% of American soy and more than half of soy worldwide is genetically modified, which is just another reason to avoid it. So it's just kind of like, seems like it would be very hard to get non-GMO organic soy, even if I was going to consume it. There's different ways that you can prepare beans and lentils for soaking them, rinsing them, doing it properly. Lots of recipes online. What do you want to favor? You want to favor lentils and mung beans soaked and sprouted, fermented tempeh and natto, natto, natto. Fermented for the tempeh basically means it's going to be easier for your body to digest. Green peas and broad beans boiled and peeled. You want to avoid soybeans and tofu, beans, particularly kidney beans, peanuts, soy protein, and other soy products. Be careful with the soy protein, actually, because soy protein is often added to, you know, protein bars or smoothies and always just substitute that out. There's always a different a different one that you can go for. Okay, fungi. Fungi is like fun. I feel like mushrooms are really having a moment in general in the last couple of years. So fungi have been used for medicinal purposes for thousands of years, particularly in Asia. More than 2,000 years ago, the Greek physician Diosocrates, cannot pronounce that, described in his classic work, talking about the benefits of them. So essentially, like it's just been around for forever. It is only in recent decades that the medicinal use of fungi has significantly cr- increased in the Western world, which we know and which we can tell, like, you know, the use of microdosing or even macrodosing or magic mushrooms, like all of these different things, it's become so, so popular now. Generally speaking, fungi are rich in fiber, vitamins B1, B2, B3, and D2, selenium, antioxidants, and protein. Many fungi contain an amino acid called L-ergothionine, which has been found to protect cells and DNA from damage. There's way more we can say about that, but we will just kind of leave it at that. So kind of like when it comes to fungi, there's so many different types of mushrooms, actually. It's pretty wild. And there's so many (laughs) that you can actually have that the list kind of just goes on and on. So what do we want to favor? We want to favor favor double extracted water and alcohol extracted, medicinal mushroom powders and tinctures. So that's like, you just want to be careful if you're using it from a medicinal standpoint, how it's made and, and what type it is. And then we want to favor things like shiitake and oyster mushrooms are great for stews and soups. Chaga tea is great. Extract powders, you know, you can have with things like chocolate, coffee, tea, smoothies. Other great ones are yellowfoot, golden chanterelle, black chanterelle, penny bun. I haven't had penny bun. Rusula mushrooms, haven't had that. Oyster mushrooms, seps, milk caps, sheep, polypore. I mean, like the names of these mushrooms are just wild in general, but there's so many that are really, really beneficial for you that 
arguably like you can't really go wrong. However, what you do want to avoid is excessive daily consumption of fungi because it can just be too much on the kidneys and the liver. So just be careful of how much you're taking. Fungi that can irritate the digestive tract when uncooked. So always cook your mushrooms. I I think most people do that. Obviously, you want to avoid poisonous fungi and consuming the common ink cap or club-footed clitocybe with alcohol. And a fungi that may have been collected a lot of heavy metals or radioactive uh, cesium. So I think, honestly, when I think it comes to mushrooms and fungi, I think you're fine. I think you're fine to like eat most of them. Be careful if you're going to like wild and forge them. Please educate yourself on like which ones are poisonous and which ones aren't. I do not know, do not know that. I am not an expert in that space. So I cannot tell you, you know, pick this one from the tree and pick this one from the soil. I do not know. Would love to learn about that though, because I really do think there is a lot of benefit to that. All right, now we're going to get into some other categories, things like coffee, some drinks. I'm not going to talk about water. I've talked about water before. It's like a whole other podcast. Hydration is huge and cannot be talked about in five minutes. (laughs) So coffee, however, is something that I'm currently not drinking right now, but I have go through phases of it. And I do, I do really like it when I have it, but I am currently just on a break for, I don't know, I'm, I'm into tea right now. I'm just going through a phase anyway. So for most people, reasonable coffee consumption, three to four cups per day is compatible with a healthy balanced diet and an active lifestyle. According to a comprehensive meta analysis, reasonable coffee consumption may extend the lifespan lower the risk of developing type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, and prevent premature death from these illnesses. The health benefits of coffee are most likely due to the antioxidants it contains, such as polyphenols. Indeed, more than 1,000 antioxidant compounds have been found in coffee, even more than in green tea and cacao. A great many people enjoy daily coffee due to its effects on stimulating and lifting up the spirits. However, the effect of coffee depends on one's genetic makeup and that, you know, we can go into the genes of that, but we're actually going to avoid that right now. And you can tell this, like some people are super sensitive to coffee and some people aren't. Some people can have a cup of coffee before they go to sleep and not have any negative side effects. And some people have to stop drinking coffee because of the caffeine content at like noon. So be very cautious of this. Kind of figure out how much caffeine works for you. So coffee is one of the ones that we do have to think about when when we're talking about organic and pesticides. So the primary risk factors in terms of harmful substances affecting the quality of coffee are pesticides and mycotoxins. Water washing significantly reduces the level of mycotoxins. And when washed properly... It is, it can be reduced by up to 90%. According to a report published recently, 12% of the tested instant coffees, roasted coffees, and hot chocolate drinks were contaminated by mycotoxins. Coffee producers have been actively involved in initiatives to guide farmers in implementing the best farming practices to minimize the risk of mold. So what do we want to do when it comes to coffee? We really want to favor organic or pesticide-free pure coffee. We want to favor single-origin coffee, water-washed coffee, coffee grown at high altitudes. And you want to avoid instant coffee, blends of several coffee bean varieties, and coffee grown near sea level or low altitudes. Time your coffee consumption based on you personally, not what other people are doing. And try to purge purchase like fresh roasted coffee if you can. Grind the beans yourself so that it is also again fresh and not sitting there ground already and use a metal filter, avoid paper filters processed with chemicals. Only purchase coffee for a maximum of two weeks consumption at a time and always store coffee in an airtight container. Do not overbrew it. Do not add sugar, milk, or cream to your coffee. That's things I think most people know. I <laughs> I follow most of that. I have a 
I, I guess I paused it. I had a subscription to a coffee company in Costa Rica that would send me coffee every month. And they do have organic ones. And it was exactly this, like high altitude, single origin. And we would consume that coffee within the month and then we would get another box. So we would only get enough for one month's worth. Right now we have a backup of it because I've stopped drinking coffee. So I've just paused it until we're ready to order it again. But I really like their coffee and it's really good. When I was in Costa Rica, I did a coffee tasting tour there and on this coffee farm. And it was, it was incredible. It was, it was awesome to learn about the beans and the trees and what makes a light roast and a medium roast and a dark roast and what is over roasted coffee and like taste the difference and see the color in the beans and understand the caffeine content for the beans. So the lighter the roast, the higher the caffeine content, which is a pity because I light roast is actually my favorite. And it was just very, very educational. I also actually went to the Starbucks farm in Costa Rica, which is very, very cool. It is very, (laughs) it's very Western, like, you know, which is not surprising. It was beautiful. Like the landscape was beautiful. The buildings, you know, the, the different things that they offer there, like it's, it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. So when you walk into a Starbucks and you know how you see those photos on the wall of like the forests and the trees and the mountains of like the different coffee trees and stuff, that is their one coffee farm that I've been to in Costa Rica. And it's worth going. Like arguably it's worth going. We didn't do a tour there. We didn't have time and you have to book in advance. But we went, we ordered coffee. We, we bought a couple of mugs, took some photos, looked at the plants. Like it was really cool. But we did another coffee tour with a local coffee company. I guess they are local, but smaller, let's say. They're called Brit Coffee, like B-R-I-T. And that was incredible. And so we got a bunch of their coffee. And yeah, it was was really great. Worth it. If you're going to go south and you're going to go to Central America, seriously invest some time into exploring coffee because you just learn so much when you actually go to these farms and understand where the food comes from. Okay, tea is next. I am big into tea right now. I'm on like a tea phase cleanse. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. It's definitely not a cleanse. It's definitely a phase. And tea is the world's second most popular drink after water. Tea is typically prepared by infusing the leaves of the tea bush. And there's like a long history of tea when it comes to, you know, how we've traded it across countries and And where it comes from, where it's grown, like there's so much to talk about with tea that I really don't want to get too much in the weeds with it. But I do want to touch on the different types of tea and kind of like which ones are the healthiest. So we have green tea. So green tea is probably one of the most studied tea varieties for its health benefits in the world. Green tea contains 30 to 40% of water soluble polyphenols, whereas black tea contains only 3 to 10%. Green tea is also suitable for individuals sensitive to caffeine due to its L-theanine content. Theanine reduces the unpleasant side effects of caffeine. So you actually see this a lot in nootropic supplements is they will add L-theanine to the supplement when there's caffeine in it to balance that caffeine out and make it less of energized you know, crash and burn type of idea. And that is because of all the studies that have been done on L-theanine and green tea and how it opposes caffeine. Then we have Herba Mate. I love Herba Mate or, you know, just Mate is a beverage prepared by steeping the leaves and new shoots of the Mate tree. Technically, it is not a variety of tea, but is used in a very similar manner. I've always had Herba Mate cold. So, so good. You know, add some honey to it type of thing. Traditionally, mate has been used as an empowering drink amongst the indigenous people of South America. Herba mate is rich in antioxidants such as quercetin, which is also actually in a lot of nootropics, vitamins B and C, and minerals, magnesium, potassium, and zinc. So mate also contains several stimulating and refreshing xanthines that are also present in coffee like caffeine and cacao, which has theobromine in it. Mate improves mood, lowers cholesterol levels, and reduces inflammation, as well as balances blood sugar. 
So next up, we have Pura tea. And I actually started drinking Pura tea when I was in university, which is so random. But essentially, I think I read that it helped with weight loss at the time. Not that I needed that, you know, but when you're at that age, you're just kind of, it was before I really understood health and nutrition and biohacking and, you know, loved the quick fix idea even though it was pretty toxic thinking at that time for me. But Pura tea is a black tea. It originates from China. The fermenting method used to prepare Pura tea makes it significantly healthier than black tea. The longer it is fermented and matured, the more valuable and healthier it is. And it is rich in polysaccharides, polyphenols, and statins. It contains slightly less caffeine than coffee. And there have been several animal tests that have found positive effects on fat metabolism and body weight, which is exactly why I was drinking it at one point. Very little research of that nature has been done on humans. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Then we have oolong tea. So in terms of oxidation level, oolong tea is placed between green tea and black tea. The same leaves can be used for steeping several times. Like green tea, oolong tea is rich in antioxidants such as various polyphenols. So I, yeah, I've, I've tried oolong tea as well. I find it quite bitter actually. Same with white tea. Oh, well, it's a little different. So white tea comes from China and it is lightly oxidized. It's a fine tea prepared for the, from the young buds and leaves of the tea bush. White tea is significantly more rare than other tea varieties and can obviously have a ton of benefits as well for that reason. So what do we want to favor? You can favor Pura tea after a high fat meal, green tea with meals, Centra matcha, you know, kind of anytime, oolong tea when you need to concentrate, again, like nootropic kind of vibes, white tea and herba mate when working. I love herba mate. I think it's a great tea to have on a work day. And like I said, I typically buy it pre-made I'm in a bottle with like honey or however they sweeten it. And I'll use it a lot on road trips actually, because I find it's really great for staying alert when I'm when I'm driving. And then there's obviously caffeine-free herbal tea in the evening. I love rooibos. Rooibos is South African. I am South African. And it is one of my favorite teas. I used to have it as a kid in my sippy cup. <laughs> and I just think it's like, yeah, it's got a lot of antioxidants and it. it's really, really rich, no caffeine. And I I just love it. You want to avoid bagged tea. So loose leaf tea is always going to be healthier. Prepared iced teas, black tea, and using milk with tea. So when you add milk to tea, it inhibits the health benefits of flavonoids. All right. Last but not least, we are diving into alcohol. This one's kind of interesting. I've talked about alcohol in very various episodes, many different ways when I've been drinking it, when I've been on detoxes, cleanses, you know, when I was doing baby steps, I did 75 hard three times and didn't have any alcohol. There's been many times in my life where I've moved away from alcohol and I've slowly been moving away from it since 2019. And the, actually the reason for that is that I got an aura ring and the aura ring really showed me the significance alcohol made on my health. And so that or a ring, it really just cascaded into me thinking, yeah, this this doesn't make sense. When I saw how low my HRV was, how high my heart rate was, how high my body temperature was, it was very sobering, as they say, to realize how detrimental alcohol is on your body. So then I started, I mean, I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but I started taking a month off every few months. So I think I was doing, there were certain months every year I wasn't drinking. So like, I think it was something like maybe April, I think it was April, October, November, and January every year I wouldn't drink, something like that. And then I, and then I started doing 75 hards. And then when I started doing those and you can't drink any alcohol for 75 days, I was like, oh, I can go a long time without this. And so then I did 75 hard three different times. And then I did Baby Steps, which is my program course that I'm creating right now, which is minimum 90 days. And I did that last year. And so I was sober during that time. And 
yeah, so I've done it multiple times. And honestly, after you get past the few, few weeks, the first few weeks, it's pretty easy to stay sober. For myself, I know that people struggle with alcohol and it's an addiction. So I can't speak for everybody, but man, I feel so much better off of it. Okay. So let's talk about alcohol. The highest consumption rates of alcohol seem to be concentrated in Europe. The highest rates can be seen in countries like Estonia, Czech Republic, Austria, Ireland, with each around 11 to 14 liters, three to six gallons per capita annually. Drinking per se and high volume drinking are consistently more prevalent among men than women. I wonder why that is. So obviously we can talk about like how much you should be having. So according to the the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, the use of alcohol is associated with at least 60 different illnesses. I bet you it's associated with everything, to be honest. Health hazards are present even with short-term liberal use, but severe hazards become apparent, particularly with long-term use. The main alcohol illnesses are alcohol dependency, alcohol poisoning, alcohol psychosis, alcohol liver diseases, and pancreatitis. In addition to these, the liberal consumption of alcohol causes neurological and psychiatric illnesses, hormonal and nutritional disorders, degeneration of the heart muscle, arrhythmia, cancer, and blood diseases. As many as 6% of all deaths are caused by alcohol. Alcohol-related causes of death are the single most significant factor in 15 to 64-year-old men ahead of coronary artery disease. Alcohol plays a role in a significant number of accidents. Based on a comprehensive demographic study report, the moderate use of alcohol, so two units of alcohol for men, one unit for women per day, in good company may reduce the risk of dementia and the impairment of cognitive functions. The study also found that heavy use, more than three to five units per day, increased the risk of dementia and impaired cognitive functions. So that study is kind of saying, hey, maybe you can have a little bit. There might be some benefits, but there is a lot of negative benefits if you overdo it. So what do you want to favor? You want to favor, you know, obviously total abstinence or consuming small amounts infrequently in good company. I think a good rule of thumb, if you don't want to be completely sober, which I understand, is to leave it to occasions only. And I think that's kind of where I would like to move to in my own personal life. So occasions would be things like a wedding or a anniversary or a birthday that type of thing. So say out of the year, there's maybe like, if you're including holidays, so say like Christmas, Thanksgiving, maybe there's 10 days out of the year that you have some alcohol. I think that is doable for most, a lot of people, most people maybe compared to having it more frequently or just com- going completely sober. So you you could do homemade tinctures, <laughs> homemade beer, Insider, good luck if you're going to do that. Good for you. Clear liquor packaged in glass bottles. So potato paste is preferable to grain-based. So there's lots of potato-based vodka that you can find. Russian Standard Imperia, Russian Standard Platinum is examples of that. Gin, tequila, and whiskey, champagne, biodynamic red wine, low tannin, no added sulfates. So I drink, when I do drink, gin typically. And that is because it kind of hits these points of it being a clear alcohol. It's typically not grain-based and it doesn't have a lot of of grains, glutens, anything like that. It's more of a herbal drink. I don't like tequila, which is why I wouldn't do tequila, but I, I do think tequila would probably be a bit healthier just because it's made from that like beautiful tequila plant, which is definitely not a grain. And then if I do drink wine, I do buy the biodynamic organic wine as often as I can. However, like I said, I'm moving away from alcohol and, you know, we'll probably get to a point where I no longer drink at all. There's also natural wines, classic herbal beers, Sprite or equivalent lemon and lime mixer. I don't know if I would do Sprite, but like kind of like make your own homemade version. And this accelerates the breakdown of acetyl 
aldehyde in the system. So what you could do is like you could do gin, soda water, lemon, lime added. I find that is a little too like plain whenever I do drink. So I would add, I'll add like crushed berries to it or oranges or anything like that just to give it flavor. Do you want to avoid lagers, colored liqueurs, alcoholic cider, sweetened sweeten with sugar, anything that's like a cooler, anything in those cans is just like filled with sugar, like hard iced teas, that type of thing. The consumption of carbonated beverage, beverages mixed with alcohol increases the absorption of alcohol. So just be careful with how much like sugar and alcohol you're having in one sitting. Some like last minute tips with this is like, there are things that you can do that can kind of help with a hangover. So you can take NAC, which is what I was always doing. So NAC is any acetylcysteine I will link the one that I have in the show notes. And basically you have this before you start drinking, while you're drinking and afterwards. And this really helps. It's a mega antioxidant in the body, helps the detoxification pathways with the liver and just helps to kind of get the acetylhyde from the system, like helps to remove it. And obviously drinking enough water while you drink is huge. So a glass of water for every glass of alcohol you have can be very helpful as well. And just making sure that, you know, you try to go to bed on time. You can also add in activated charcoal. So a lot of people do this. They go home with, at the end of the night and they will have activated charcoal. And this binds the toxins that have formed. And that's about it for nutrition. So that was a deep dive. This was part two. Please go back and listen to part one if you haven't listened to it. The next deep dive we're doing is on exercise. This series is all about you know, general recommendations for people. It's not specific to women or men or, you know, in the preconception stage or fertility that I talk about a lot right now. This is just biohacking one-on-one for these different topics. So first I did sleep. Now I did nutrition. The next up is exercise, which is going to be fun to do. I would argue that exercise is the least amount of, the least amount, I would argue that exercise, I know the least amount about exercise out of all of these. Exercise seems seems to be my, I don't know, I don't want to say weakness, but definitely not as educated in that space right now. However, I wonder if I will be soon. I wonder if that's something that I can pursue in order to understand things better. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for listening. Please sign up for my Baby Steps course coming out very, very soon if you're interested in optimizing your preconception health and fertility. It's made for men and for women, and it's really to help you get pregnant easily and fast and just optimizing your health before that and and increasing your chances of successful conception, as well as a healthy pregnancy and a healthy birth, and most of all, a healthy baby. So you can do that on my website. Everybody on the waiting list gets $100 off the course. Only those people on the waiting list will get that. Everyone else will not get that. And it will be regular price. So you can go and check that out right now. And I will catch you later this week for another episode. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.